Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. The New York Historical Society, located at 170 Central Park West between 76th and 77th Streets on New York's Upper West Side, was founded in 1804 as New York's first museum, its mission to record the rich history of New York and the story of America. With us is Louise Mirror, guiding spirit of the museum for the past two decades. Under her leadership, the society has reinvigorated its commitment to greater public understanding of history and its relevance today, as well as the support and encouragement of historical scholarship and the education of young people. The New York Post says Louise Mirror is one of the 50 most influential women in New York. I don't know about the other 49, but her work at the Historical Society has influenced us all. We're pleased to welcome Louise Mirror to the program. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, Louise, uh, what goes into a great museum director? Oh, dear. <laughs> I think it's really drive. Um, you know, it's a lot of drive to, to carry out the mission of the institution and, um, and a lot of work, um, you know, a lot of hours dedicated to thinking about how the institution can thrive, how it can really tell the stories that it ought to tell and needs to tell, and uh, how to make it all work by raising money. Okay, now uh, let's just talk about you for a moment. You were a Spanish major in college. <laughs> Indeed, um, I you know always loved languages. I um, I also took a lot of science courses. I was sort of hedging my bets. Maybe I would become a doctor like my father, uh, but I decided in the end, um, having taken a wonderful course in medieval history uh, as an undergraduate, that I would actually focus on uh, stories about the Middle Ages that I thought were revelatory in many ways about the modern period. Uh, and uh, your professional life um, took you here to CUNY for a while, didn't it? Indeed, it did. Tell I, us uh, about uh, that experience. Well, I loved being a scholar. Um, after I'd written a book that I had really longed to write about, uh, it was a book that told the story of women, Muslim, and Jews, three underrepresented groups uh, in the medieval canon, both history and literature, um, but with you know, really fascinating, uh, fascinating accounts. Uh, I thought, well, if, I, you know, if the world never hears from me again on medieval literature and history, it will not be impoverished, but there are ways in which I could promote other people's work. And, um, and I found that mechanism in uh, administration. I became vice provost for arts, sciences, and engineering when I was at the University of Minnesota. And then I was recruited to CUNY to become essentially provost for the system. It was a very big job, but an absolutely thrilling one. And I had every opportunity that uh, I ever dreamed of really to, to make a difference in education until the New York Historical Society came along. Well, I was at CUNY for seven wonderful years. We, uh, we accomplished a, a huge amount during that time. We really rationalized in many ways the system so that it worked as a system. Uh, but um, I, I was bitten by the bug of running a cultural institution long before. And my mother, who had been a historian, had done her research in the 40s at the New York Historical Society. So I always had a kind of affinity for it. And it's a very scholarly institution. So at the same time that it satisfied my urge to actually tell history, not just think about it, uh, it, um, it also had great potential to be realized uh, in terms of scholarship, pushing forward the, the boundaries of knowledge. Now, I'm always interested in names, uh, what's in a name. And uh, the New York Historical Society has a curious hyphen <laughs> between New and York, uh, just the way the French say New York. <laughs> <laughs> so is there a reason for that? Uh, uh, have you thought of removing the hyphen, or uh, do you like it there? So the hyphen is there because in the 19th century, if you wanted to, uh, to attach an adjective to a place name, you, um, an adjective like New to a place name like York, you, uh, you used a hyphen in between the two. So 
place names that no longer have the hyphen, like Oyster Bay, for example, in the 19th century were hyphenated, as was the New York Times, by the way. Uh, all of them, to my knowledge, decided to do away with their hyphen. And mm. the New York Historical Society thought about it. Um, and then the, um, the city council in the early 20th century raised a huge ruckus and demanded that the New York Historical Society, which is a private institution, get rid of its hyphen. Well, that put an end to that discussion. So, uh, so we remained with the hyphen, and it's been there ever since. So Although, it's there despite the New York City Council. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Not today. The City Council has been hugely generous to us, and uh, I don't think they mind the hyphen at all. But, but it has been discussed over and again. Yes. Now, does the New York refer to New York City? New York State, does it have any uh, reference to your collection? Or uh, Because uh, there's been a vast mission creep, hasn't there? You uh, are doing uh, things that are uh, uh, widely American, don't involve New York. You're doing things that may not even involve America. So uh, tell us about that. Yeah, so our original charter in 1804 said that we would collect and preserve uh, and disseminate around New York State history and American history, national history, the history of the nation and the state. It said nothing about New York because in 1804, it was not entirely apparent that New York City would find itself in the privilege position that it finds itself today. New York had been burned twice during the American Revolution, uh, though it was, you know, the first capital of the new nation, it wasn't a capital for long. And um, it just really wasn't clear that it would e eclipse Boston and Philadelphia. So no one really thought that the city itself had a kind of history that uh, really needed to be expanded upon in a whole museum. So we were never founded to tell the, the story of the city of New York. If you look at our collection, which is vast, you'll see that it's virtually all there, though it's very wide ranging. And some of it, as you say, has nothing to do with New York, either state or city. Um, and some of it is European, so uh, therefore having nothing to do with, uh, with the United mm -hmm. States either. But it's all there because of some connection with New York. So, uh, you know, virtually everything in our collection has, uh, it may have been a collector who traveled far and wide and brought something back and um, it became accessioned into our collection. So there is a New York and typically a New York City connection, but it isn't the kind that many people think of when they see New York Historical Society. Now, New York, uh, New York City, uh, Federalist Hall is where George Washington was inaugurated, took the oath of office to preserve, protect, and defend, which uh, Donald Trump doesn't think includes support. Uh, but you have uh, the chair where he sat when he was inaugurated. How'd you get that? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, until for, for about 70 years, we were New York's only museum. So, if anything were to come to a museum uh, as part of it, its collection, it would come to us. So, um, you know, so the chair did, we now uh, actually have Washington's Bible that he swore the oath of office on, and we have the balustrade that he stood in back of when he took the oath of office. Uh, all of those materials were uh, typically given to us. In some cases, we acquired them, particularly on the library side. Uh, but um, there simply was no other place. And uh, that's, you know, that's how a lot of our collection happened to be in our, our building and, uh, and beyond. Have you ever sat in the chair? No, I... Um, have you ever wanted to? Uh, I have wanted to, mm -hmm. and many other people have as well. We have a very strict conservation staff, excellent conservation staff at New York Historical. And um, they really are, you know, dead set against anyone sitting in that chair or any of the other many chairs we have in our collection. So they make no exception for the director. <laughs> Not so far. Well, someday your chair might be in the museum. <laughs> I don't know about that. It's a very ordinary chair that I sit in. So tell me, you're aware of uh, uh, 
dispute or debate um, among historians as to whether history should be approached uh, top down uh, from uh, the um, uh, leaders of the day, the, the, the well-known figures, George Washington is a good example, um, or from the bottom up. Uh, so have you adopted either of those philosophies? Uh, no, um, we do some of, some of each one, which I think is the sensible way to behave uh, in, in terms of history. There was um, a moment, and uh, for some people it's continued to the present, where the, um, the, the belief was expressed that it's really the people who make history and therefore we should be seeking out their voices, though some of them are very, very difficult to discern. Uh, it's, it's doable, it's not a futile way of looking at history and it certainly is important to have a holistic sense. But um, you know, let's all recognize that it's leaders, decision makers, opinion, leaders who actually make the decisions that chart our course. And if anyone doubts that, uh, you know, you just need to look at any presidency that we've, that we've ever had, beginning with George Washington, to see how the decisions that are made by the president and also by governors and senators and, uh, you know, really other, uh, other elected leaders and people in, uh, in other environments that are leaders. I mean, it is really their decision making that tends to have the greatest impact on the charting the, the course of the nation. So you need, you need to do both. You need to have a holistic sense of history. But to say that, you know, really the you know, decision makers aren't that important is uh, just to, you know, really present a false picture of how things become the way they become. Okay, so the uh, well-known architectural critic, uh, Paul Goldberger, wrote a book called Why Architecture Matters. Uh, why does history matter? Oh, gosh. <laughs> you know, it sounds banal to say it, but if we don't know on whose shoulders we all stand, then we really are not understanding our present moment and uh, really can't behave sensibly in terms of going forward towards the future. The, um, the past doesn't, it doesn't predict the future, but it informs our behavior. And if we don't understand it, then we're impoverished in many, many ways. Well, one of your uh, trustees, Neil Ferguson, uh, has advocated uh, that the president should set up a, a council of historians so that uh, the historical record is uh, readily available to the decision makers. Uh, do you support that idea? Absolutely. I think uh, it's a brilliant, brilliant uh, um, essay. And it, uh, you know, I mean, the president regularly feels the need to consult a council of, of scientists. Um, council of economists. A con council of economists. Historians would have a lot to, uh, to, to say that would be highly informative. And Neil in that essay gives several examples of times when it would have been extremely useful for the president to have consulted historians before going ahead to catastrophic uh, effect in some cases. Okay, so uh, let's uh, talk about uh, one of your uh, exhibitions, which was uh, a wild success, and that was uh, your exhibition, that's about 13 years ago, on uh, slavery. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, uh, Nikki Haley said uh, that uh, the American Civil War wasn't about slavery. She later dialed that back. But uh, was the American Civil War about slavery? And uh, did slavery really uh, impact New York's history? And what's the, I mean, what's the big deal about slavery that you had this big exhibition? <laughs> <laughs> Very big deal. Uh, and yes, of course, the Civil War was about slavery. There's copious evidence that slavery was had been very much on Lincoln's mind uh, long before he became president, uh, that it was absolutely on his mind, his cabinet member's mind, uh, um, when the South seceded. And of course, the South seceded because it feared 
that the um, the way of life that had developed uh, over centuries in the South would be uh, eroded or eradicated because slavery was the basis for that society. Uh, our exhibition on slavery in New York really responded to historical discovery, which is really the best best way you can think about an exhibition as a history museum. Uh, in, the, in the 1990s, um, as part of development of Lower Manhattan, some burial grounds were discovered. They were African burial grounds. And no one had really thought very much about slavery in, in, in the North, let alone slavery in New York. And of course, we think of ourselves as such a progressive city that it seemed impossible to many people that we could have had any, anything in common with uh, the slaveholding Southerners. Uh, but in fact, the Dutch brought the first enslaved people to, to New York in the 17th century. And, uh, and slavery grew under the British so that during the colonial, the, the British colonial period, there were more enslaved people in New York than anywhere else in the American colonies except for Charleston, South Carolina. So extraordinary. If you had been walking around on the streets of New York in, uh, in the 18th century, first part of the 18th century, you would have uh, encountered one, one out of every five people you encountered would have been enslaved. So slavery had uh, a very important role in uh, the building of New York City. The wall on Wall Street, the Broadway, which would eventually reach Harlem, ironically, um, and so much else in early New York was literally built by enslaved people. And it, um, you know, it left an imprint, the first public, uh, among the first public schools to be developed were the African free schools that people like Alexander Hamilton and John Jay developed because they envisaged a time when slavery would end in New York and the children of enslaved people would need to be educated. So, um, you know, so, so there was just such evidence uh, that slavery had played an exceedingly important role in the history of, of New York, uh, New York City, but New York State writ large, that um, it seemed inevitable that an institution like ours should tell that story. So if I visited the museum at the time of the slavery exhibition, what uh, kinds of materials would I have seen? Well, you would have seen, um, uh, you know, examples um, uh, like a, a very small uh, set of shackles um, that were created for a very small child, an infant, essentially, that would have made you think, what could people be thinking? Uh, I mean, it's, you know, items like that that really evoke the emotional, uh, a set of um, regulations that the British had developed to regulate uh, how black people, because under the British, slavery and um, race became one and the same. Virtually every black person on the streets of New York uh, was an enslaved person. And the British developed regulations. They had to carry around lanterns after dark and um, much else. Uh, but you would have seen signs of resistance, many signs of resistance. and. And um, there was quite, quite a lot of that. And you also would have seen the development of great and important abolitionists, both black and white, in New York. So, uh, you know, virtually no story is one way or the other way. Um, the story of slavery in New York is, you know, is, is one um, that we would recognize as a familiar story of horrific oppression but it's also one of resistance and eventual abolition and, um, and eventual triumph. I mean, we have a black mayor today in New York. And no, many, he wasn't the first. And he is not the first either. Um, and we have many examples, uh, of course, of black leadership in this city. So it is, uh, you know, it's, it's important to understand that history, but it's also important to understand that uh, this is America. We live in a democracy. And, and you can change things, and we have. Okay, so another exhibition you had, uh, uh, which was uh, another story of what happened in our democracy, is, uh, was the one on the Vietnam War. 
Mm -hmm. Now, you were a Vietnam War protester, weren't you? Absolutely. Um, you know, I was young at the time, but my parents were uh, very, very stridently opposed to the war. It created a huge amount of friction in my family. My, my grandfather was a World War I veteran, very, very proud of his service in the military, and was among the majority of Americans at the time who believed that you had to support American uh, military efforts to preserve democracy. And that, of course, is how the Vietnam War was uh, was portrayed. That's how it was pitched. It was pitched, right. It was pitched as, you know, I mean, you, you let it, you let the communists take over Vietnam, you know, the domino theory. Every, everywhere else is going to collapse and eventually we're not going to have democracy anywhere. And um, I went to protests as a kid. Uh, um, in school, you know, my mother wrote a note saying she's absent today, Louise is absent today because she's mm. sick of the war. And, um, you know, we were very, very serious about protesting what we perceived as a, as a senseless adventure um, in, uh, in a place that, you know, really had, just didn't have uh, very much bearing on, uh, on Americans and the loss of life, you know, we'd already seen when the uh, when the French were in Vietnam, we'd already seen a huge loss of life, and it was foreseeable that that would only continue to to no positive end. And is that the message uh, that you sought to convey in in, in the exhibit? And uh, talk a little bit about the materials you presented yeah. to people. So no, uh, was it me lie and atrocities, <laughs> right. or uh, we were you talking about communism taking over the world? Well, what we did in the exhibition, um, first of all, no, because you know uh, the really positive thing about history is when you study it, it makes you see things differently, and. Um, what we did in the first gallery of that exhibition was to go through all of the presidents, um, beginning really with, with FDR, but really with Truman. Um, I mean, you know, had FDR lived uh, at the end of World War II, probably, you know, probably we would not have had this trajectory that led us to be so enmeshed in Vietnam. Um, but presidents began to think differently about the threat of communism. Um, and we went through, you know, beginning with Truman and ending with Nixon, we went through all the American presidents who kept getting us a little bit more involved in Vietnam uh, after a while, simply because they didn't want to be the president to be responsible for the, um, for the communist uh, success in, in that part of the world. Um, so we, we told a story that was really, you know, about how a nation becomes mired in uh, in in a war that's far away from its shores, which you know is a message that we continue continues to resonate today. Um, but we were very balanced. Um, we were very sympathetic to the Vietnam War veterans who came home and were punished uh, and so uh, so horribly treated. Um, and you know, we told a little bit about Vietnam today. Uh, so it was, um, it was certainly not, not an exhibition I would have foreseen in my youth. Now, we, uh, I hate to be a Manhattan chauvinist, but we do have uh, museums of uh, American history in uh, the Bronx, in Staten Island, uh, probably have it in Brooklyn, I'm not sure. We have it in Queens. Uh, what's so unique about the New York Historical Society? Well, um, apart from being first, which means that our collections are, are more robust than anyone else's around the history of New York and the nation, um, we're, we're a much larger institution. I mean, we're quite large. Uh, um, our uh, capacity for exhibitions is much greater um, than uh, virtually any other institution organized around history in the city. And we have a great library which is, uh, although not completely unique in its size and its breadth and its wonder, it is, uh, it is absolutely second only to the Library of Congress for early American history. Okay, we've got, so. we've got to stop because I have a question for you. Uh, and the question is, what do you hope 
a visitor will take away from uh, uh, going to the New York Historical Society? Well, I hope uh, that people who visit us on site, and of course we have a big online presence as well, but people who visit us on site will be touched in some way by what they see. They'll have a better understanding of their present moment, and they'll um, be activists. They'll see themselves once they leave as, as needing to take an active role as citizens in the world. And um, we have a great big expansion in our future, 70,000 square feet of additional space, which will be focused on American democracy and substantially on education. Well, I've been there and I uh, recommend that everybody go. Uh, but Louise Murray, this has just been wonderful. And thank you for coming by. Thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversation. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care. Be well and all the best.